Well, welcome to another Tuesday discussion, Eric. It is great to see you. Yeah. And uh, I, I did want to point out that we have some stellar mugs. Oh, you like uh, those? I do. Yeah. I'm actually very excited that we finally actually have mugs that l look less girly and look very manly. So, hey, David, are you able to catch one of these? Which shot should I go on? Can you see that? Oh, that, that one, the main one? Uh, and so it has our logo on it. And we, we don't sell these, though. I think you know, one of the things we were discussing earlier is like we should like put something like that in the store. It could, like make some bonus bucks. People are drinking their coffee in the morning, feeling very spiritual, having an Ellerslie logo on there. That's true. That well, they just actually time. look fun. So, uh, I mean, I want I want to take one home. Uh, so maybe after we film this season of uh, Daily Daily Thunders, maybe I'll just uh What's funny is I don't think, because we don't really have any drink. Okay? <laughs> this is like a total decor <laughs> item. We should stick some uh, some good chai in there, and I could be like sipping it during the, the thing, and the, the slurping sounds could get into the microphone. That'd be powerful. I it mean, would. I think it'd be great for the, uh, for the Daily Thunder. <laughs> well, we should probably actually get to the question that we're supposed <laughs> to be talking about today. Uh, one of the things that I've been noticing, and I've been hearing this a lot from a lot of Christians, especially just in the craziness of our culture and society mm -hmm. today, but it's, all right, I, I know that God provided in the past and I know that God has done a lot of things in the past, mm -hmm. but does God still provide for our needs yeah. today? Can we still hold God to his nature today? Right. And, you know, one of the amazing things about the I amness, it's a strange way of saying it, but God calls himself I am, which means he is always the same. So yes is a simple answer. There was a question that came uh, up the other day. We were in a father-son time, and the question was a, was a really good one from a young man who's sort of entering that season of life of uh, recognizing that provision just doesn't come from your father anymore as you grow up, that you really need to now take some things on your own shoulders. And uh, the question was, well, what if, as, because I'm a Christian, you know, I lose my job. I, you know, my bank account's locked down. I mean, there's all sorts of things that, that you could envision, right, happening because you're a Christian. What, how do I live? How do I survive? There's a very simple question. It just sort of intersects that 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 at the at the very core of it, and that is, whoa, whoa, God. Do you know who God is? One of His names is Jehovah Jireh which Jehovah is the I am side of it. So I am and then Jireh. What is that? The I am provides, which means he sees ahead of time, provision. He sees ahead what we need and will always make supply. That is a guarantee at the very baseline of the Christian understanding that God sees our need before we get there and will always supply for it which goes to this desperate need that we have as believers to have faith. Mm -hmm. In other words, one of the reasons why Abraham is, is called such a man of faith is because God kept promising. Mm -hmm. And Abraham, even though he never even saw the fulfillment always of that promise, he held on to the fact that God cannot lie. The fact that God is a provider that, okay, if God said, I'm going to be the father of many nations or, you know, the of, of countless children, mm -hmm. well then, all right, even though I only see it one son, I, I trust I trust God. It's it's an amazing reality that Amen. knowing God's character, especially the fact that He's a provider, almost forces or demands the fact that we are people of faith, that we are That's trusting, right. trusting in our God. We wriggle at the notion of being put in situations where we need to see God be faithful, and I think you and I yep. totally know that drama because we've walked through it. This entire ministry has function not because we set out to necessarily we we set out to in this ministry say god we want you to build us the way you want to build us so that's that's a genuine statement some of the ups and downs we've gone through have forced you and i to have to be believers in exactly what we teach yep. eric and nathan do you believe that god will supply there were situations where it was impossible that this ministry could keep going and every single time we've seen god supply every time without fail and so that's still our testimony. Over After all these years, God is faithful. He is Jehovah Jireh. So Genesis 22 is going to enunciate that notion of on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So that's the Abraham Isaac scenario. That's when it's first mentioned. That's when the debut of this idea of Jehovah Jireh is going to come. But then we're going to see that pattern unfold throughout the rest of scripture. And so we're going to see that God is, is in control of all the events that he is it's like the master chess player he allows the enemy to play his move it's like oh what do you have going on over there oh devil and then no matter what the devil seems to play god's like gotcha 
mm-hmm. checkmate. And you just don't want to play chess with, with God Almighty. He's just really good at this. And so the same is true with our circumstances. And so at any point in time, we can say to God, God, I recognize I've taken control of my own life. I need you to help me. And God immediately is present tense there as our savior, as our deliverer, and our provider. Even if we have mishandled our resources, he is our provider. He knows what we need and he loves to care for us. And I actually think God absolutely loves the impossible. In other words, it actually seems all throughout scripture, God is consistently letting things get to a point where it is impossible Mm -hmm. so that he can provide. In other words, if, if we're not brought into a position if we're brought into a position where we could actually handle it ourselves, then we actually don't have to trust that he is a provider. But right. it's when we're in those impossible situations, when when Gideon is looking at the Median army, when uh, Moses is backed up to the Red Sea, which I'd love for you to talk yeah. more about, or or you know, here here is all of hell standing against Jesus at the cross. It, it's in those impossible situations all throughout Scripture that God goes, "Now I can show myself." It's like mm-hmm. the uh, Ephesians three passage that I can go exceedingly abundantly beyond. Mm-hmm all that you can ask or think. It's like I I purposely leverage things or I allow things to be impossible so that I can show that I'm actually a provider. And we have a name for it that we've sort of not coined, but it's, it's our phrase. You know, we always are looking for simple ways to enunciate things and we just call it the Mayflower screw. And the Mayflower screw is just sort of a picture of that. Cause when Moses is backed up to the Red Sea, you could, it could appear at first blush that God has forsaken them. You know, he's going to do these 10 great miracles in delivering them out of Egypt and everything is so amazing. But then three days journey and they're already in an impossible situation. The people of Israel are going to turn on Moses, pick up rocks to stone him. <laughs> it's like, uh, guys, is that how quickly your faith erodes just because you enter into a difficulty? You almost get the sense that God purposely leads us to back up to Red Seas, where there's mountains on both sides. There's a hostile uh, enemy army coming at us, just happens to be the most powerful military force in the world at the time. And then the other side of you, you have a sea that is impassable. What are you going to do in that moment? And that's the key moment that I think God has to bring us to. And one of the things I love in Josephus' account when he reflects on uh, that history uh, that he is. So Josephus lived, was a contemporary of Jesus, actually, historian, Jewish historian. So he writes down the same story he, and not necessarily as a Christ believing man. He's going to just re- relay the histories of the Jews. Fascinating stuff. And he gives this quote to Moses in that moment when all the people of Israel are melting with fear. And Moses is going to say, it is no better than madness to despair in the providence of God now. I love that statement. It's not in the Bible, but it's a statement that historically the Jews have uh, have equated to Moses. But think about that. Providence and provide. The, the, the two, the same thing. But the providence of God is the fact that we believe as, as Christians that God has seen everything that is needed for us to walk in triumph. And he is going to make supply for that. He is going to provide for us before it happens. And so the providence of God, he's saying, God brought us here, guys. God knows best, and so Moses' reasoning is God can flatten these mountains on either side. He can wipe this uh, army off the face of the earth, or he could part this sea and we could walk across on dry land. One of the other options I think Josephus mentions is that, oh, or we could all fly out of here. (laughs) (laughs) Which would have been so amazing. Oh, could you imagine if that was what God did? I mean, but it's truly remarkable that God has a solution in every situation. So the reason we call it a Mayflower screw is because when the Mayflower was coming across uh, the Atlantic Ocean from England to the New World, uh, you have a people that are just desperate to get out of that persecution, that state of difficulty they were in. They're just so excited to get to this new world. But halfway across the Atlantic, I mean, right sort of near the middle, their mast snaps. And back in ye Which old... not good. No, back in ye <laughs> old days, that's a very, very bad thing. And so they're in a paralysis sort of situation where the crew, who's not believers are just panicking, saying, I think we're closer to England than we are to the New World. Maybe we should turn around. And the pilgrims are like, oh, no, don't turn around. The first thing we're going to do is pray. Because we believe that God saw this before it happened, and he has a solution. And so that's why we call it the Mayflower Screw. In every situation where you hit the crisis, you hit the Red Sea, you hit the snapped mast, that you actually start by believing that God knew this and he has made supply for it because he, he is Jehovah Jireh. 
And so the way that they used to call, this is the ancient Puritan sort of articulation of it, was God has a means of grace. He has a way of supplying no matter what's going on. And that's what we need to know in our situation. Yeah, we, we, we're not sort of the old-fashioned Christians, and we're the modern Christians. But did God sort of keep doing what he does? Of course. And so here we are, what, 1620? Uh, and is that right? No, that was Columbus. Uh, in, no, it was. It was the Mayflowers in 1620. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean. I need to make sure <laughs> I get my American history right here. So we're in 1620, 400 years ago. That's pretty cool. This is the 400 year anniversary. So this is the 400 year anniversary of this truth. Oh, this right? is powerful. <laughs> and so they pray and they believe that God has a supply. But how do you fix a mast in the middle of the ocean? You know what you would need? You would need something like a huge metal contraption that would literally go through all the wood and hold it together again. Well, where are you going to find that in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? So the pilgrims pray and they believe that God has a supply. So now it's like, God, give us wisdom. Show us what it is. And so one of them has an idea. Let's go down into the storage compartment of the ship and let's look and see what we have. And sure enough, there's a printing press with this huge long screw in it that just happens to perfectly be suited to fix the mast. And the pilgrims arrive in America. That's an incredible statement. And their arrival in America changes the history of this continent. Hmm. God has supply for us right now in our current situations, mm -hmm. which seem rather tumultuous and tenuous, but God knew we were coming here and he has supplied everything we need for life and godliness. Amen. <clears throat> or as Hebrews says, you know, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means he's always been a provider. He is still our provider this day and he always will be. So regardless Amen. what happens in culture, regardless what happens in the economy, regardless what happens with the world as a whole, uh, we can actually trust our God because he... He is a provider. Amen. It's a beautiful truth. And it is no better than madness yes. to despair in the providence of God now. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Well, before we go, I, we just want to introduce you to Honorable Manhood. If you've not heard of Honorable Manhood, Eric, this has been a couple of years now, yeah. uh, was per putting some stuff together for his sons in terms of how do you walk through this idea of manhood and sexuality and, and being a man in this generation with all the craziness and everything is accessible. And so you put together a kind of an, what we, what we turn into an online training of eight weeks for people to walk through for men, whether it be fathers and sons or men's groups or individuals to, to gain a vision of what true masculinity is, especially lived out practically in these days that we live in. So if you're interested, uh, we're going to play a little media piece to introduce you to this incredible program that we would invite you to participate in called Honorable Manhood. See you next time. Manhood is under siege today. We've lost the picture of grand masculinity for this generation of men to discover and to see. Now, I have boys that are coming into that age where they need a vision, they need a map. For all of you fathers out there that are like, how do we do this? I'm right there with you. And I have developed an eight-week training course for fathers and sons called Honorable Manhood. And it's the idea of taking this vision that God has for masculinity and planting it deep within our boys. Let's work together to see this impartation take place. Come join me.